Um, hi, this is Don Forsyth, and welcome to another installment of Group Dynamics mini lectures. Um, before we deal with the many, many topics examining group dynamics and group processes, we, we first need to speak at, at least briefly about research methods. How was all of this information about groups obtained in the first place? When I begin my analysis of, of research procedures, I generally like to st start with the great sociologist George Caspar Homan's definition of science, where he wrote, when the truth of a relationship lies finally in the data themselves, and nature, however stretched out on the rack, still has a chance to say no, then the subject is a science. In that very simple definition, he's identifying what I think are the two key aspects of science, which are measurement. You must stretch nature out in the rack somehow. And secondly, you have to test your hypotheses about the phenomena that you investigate. In our case, our hypotheses about group processes. There is, of course, a third aspect of science which is equally important, which is the development of a coherent theoretical structure that can account for the phenomenon that you're investigating. We'll deal with all three of these aspects of science in these presentations. Thank you, as always, for joining me. Moving right along, measurement, research methods, and theoretical perspectives. In terms of measurement, we'll deal just with observation and self-report, recognizing, of course, there's many other ways to measure group phenomena. And then we'll deal with three basic types of research methods before turning to theoretical perspectives. For observation, we'll begin this with an example, which is William Foote White's classic study of the Corner Boys and Street Corner Society. As a graduate student at Harvard, uh, White did a long-term study with groups at what he called Cornerville, but was actually part of Boston. Um, he joined those particular groups. He took detailed notes about the behavior of the individuals in the specific group he joined and other groups as well, and he wrote them up in his classic book, Street Corner Society. There are, of course, many different ways to conduct observational research. Three here are overt, covert, and participant. Um, White himself was used participant observation. He actually joined the group. He belonged to it, and they knew he was studying them, although over time they pretty much forgot that uh, he was actually conducting research. And very rarely did he actually record information in front of the group members. He generated that later after his, his group involvement was over. So it, it was an overt participant but also a participant observation approach. And they often you summarize findings. In his case, in terms of the structure of the group, Doc was the leader of the group. These were the, the substructures as well. One thing you have to worry about, of course, with research of this is what's been known as Hawthorne effects, although the term Hawthorne effect is quite controversial. Um, it is the idea that when people are observed, and know they're being observed by social scientists, they may alter their behavior, um, and so do not, do not act in natural ways any more than an animal in a zoo acts as an animal might in its natural habitat. Um, so that is probably the reason why many observers of group process, in fact, use covert observational approaches. Here's just a few examples of this method which has been applied to observe groups. Some of these were case study methods, but not all of them. We have examples of studies of gangs, of doomsday group, work teams, mushroom collectors uh, by Gary Vine. We have search and rescue team teams, inner city gangs more recently by the political scientist Vankatesh. And even online groups can be studied through participate, participant observation. Sociologist Bainbridge, for example, joined groups in the world of Warcraft on a regular basis and made observations of their dynamics. Uh, here's, for example, a picture that he uh, captured while he was in World of Warcraft. I believe that is likely Bainbridge himself uh, meeting with uh, a group uh, from his guild, I believe, in one of the taverns in World of Warcraft. Observation is sometimes structured observation rather than generally qualitative observation. 
Uh, this is an, one example of such a structuring system developed by Robert Fried Bale's Interaction Process Analysis, or IPA. Uh, he recommends that uh, observer goes in ready to take note of what occurs after years and years of analyzing group process. Bales came up with these 12 categories of very prominent sorts of behaviors typically observed in groups, and he organized them into socio-emotional areas, which are positive, task areas, which are positive, task areas involving questions, and more negative socio-emotional areas. The idea is the observer should be aware of these 12 types of actions and can note the frequency of them when they occur. He has subsequently uh, revised this model um, and now it's described uh, in his SIMLOG approach, his systematic multiple-level observation of groups model, uh, which has 26 categories of behaviors rather than 12. Self-report measures are very simple, just based on the idea that if you want to know what somebody is thinking or feeling or experiencing, why don't you simply ask them and record their responses? Um, it does turn out that White actually used this technique very frequently. He interviewed the members of the group. He didn't simply rely on observation. But a good, another good example of that might be uh, Jacob Marino's classic use in his sociometry. He was interested in trying to understand the interpersonal connections among group members. And he would create images of the groups he studied, which he referred to as sociograms. This would be an example of a sociogram. When one completes a sociogram, one can identify things like who are members of the clique, where are couples, two people who have reciprocal bonds, who are gatekeepers, individuals who perhaps can stand at the periphery of a group and keep information from flowing in the group and out group, isolates, rejected, sociable stars, the most popular member, and unsociable people who aren't linked very strongly to the group. More modern applications of sociometry would, would take the form of social network analysis where information about even incredibly large groups, such as friendship networks on Facebook, can be examined using social network analysis and identify the structures linking group members together. Measurement, observation, self-report. Uh, now let's deal very briefly with research methods, and we'll start with uh, case studies, if, if you will. Case study is an analysis of one particular group, maybe more than one, but in the simplest case, it's just one group. You examine it in detail and try to extract general generalizations, overarching theoretical principles from the analysis of that group. Within group dynamics, the classic example of this is Irving Janus's theory of groupthink. He developed this theory by conducting archival analyses of groups that made disastrous decisions. Um, for example, the, the group that was responsible for planning the, the defense of Pearl Harbor prior to the United States entry into the Pacific uh, World, into the Pacific War during World War II. Um, why did the group make such a terrible mistake? Janice suggests that they experienced uh, something he calls groupthink, which is a disastrous uh, approach to making decisions when your group is so cohesive it can no longer respond logically or rational to the information it's trying to process. Other examples of case studies, we probably already encountered them. I would, in some respects, White's study was a case study. Certainly, Festinger's study of that doomsday group was a case study, mushroom collectors, and, and so on. Second method, experiments. Uh, usually have to have these key characteristics, such as you have to manipulate an independent variable, measure a dependent variable, control other variables as much as possible. So the independent variable is going to be your causal variable. It is the one that you manipulate. You change its level so that you can see what impact a change in this variable has on other variables. Those other variables need to be measured. Um, and those would be called your dependent variables. Independent variables are independent of, they stand apart from the situation because they're manipulated by the experimenter. Dependent variables are called dependent variables because they depend upon the independent variable. In an experiment, you do try to control other variables as much as possible so that they are not influencing your outcome. If there are uncontrolled variables which are systematically associated with your independent variable, then one of the, the key benefits of doing experiments. Your capacity to draw causal inferences will be weakened. An example of that, of such a study, might be Lewin Lippitt and White's classic study of leadership, 
where they were interested in the impact of different styles of leadership on groups. So they manipulated leadership style. Um, they had three different kinds. Laissez-faire leader, who was relatively standoffish, didn't provide much direction. A democratic leader, who worked closely with the young boys who were part of the study. And the autocratic leader, who primarily simply gave orders to the boys and had them carry them out. For the most part, his research indicated, their research, Lewin Lippitt and White's research, indicated that people were happiest and possibly more productive when working under a democratic leader. Although many of the groups that they investigated fell under the sway of the autocratic leader, and when they did so, and they did not show evidence of rebellion, uh, they, they were fairly uh, productive, even with the autocratic leader. Final type of study, a correlational study. Uh, that's where you aren't able to or simply don't want to manipulate the independent variable, but instead measure two or more, more variables. And then using statistics. In most cases, you assess the strength of the relationship between those variables. Um, Newcomb's, Newcomb's, Theodore Newcomb's Bennington study is a good example of that. As a professor at Bennington, he was fascinated by the shifts in attitudes displayed by those college students. Bennington is a, a small college in, in New England. And at the time, many of the, the entering freshmen tended to be relatively conservative in their political attitudes. but. By the time they graduated, they had shifted to become more liberal. Bennington wondered how that could take place, and so he systematically assessed the attitudes of college students over a four-year period. And he did conclude that social processes, specifically um, group processes, the strength of the relationships among members, were in all likelihood responsible for that shift in attitudes. For the overall climate was Benning that Bennington was quite liberal. Um, it being a relatively experimental kind of college. Uh, and so by the time the freshmen um, ended up as seniors, they'd adopted the overall political outlook of the group. Correlational studies are called correlational studies because usually you express their, your findings using a statistic known as a correlation, which simply ex describes the strength of the relationship between two variables, and as probably everybody listening to this knows, uh, can vary from minus one to plus one. The further away from zero, the stronger the relationship with the sign indicating the direction of the relationship. Uh, negative sign indicates that the two variables are, are related in opposite ways to each other, uh, conversely related. So as one goes up, the other goes down. A positive sign indicates that they vary together directly. As one goes up, the other goes up. All three methods are, are excellent methods to use to, to advance our understanding of groups and their dynamics. Case studies, uh, they're very time consuming. They're a bit more atypical. More rarely do you, you read about a case study, uh, but still studies such as Janice's are, have a dramatic impact on the field. Experiments are often criticized for being too artificial. Uh, in many cases, you create groups in the laboratory and then manipulate variables in that setting. Field experiments are more difficult to, to conduct, um, but they have the advantage of yielding the clearest information about cause and effect. Correlational studies, um, and particularly as our statistical techniques have grown stronger and stronger, although they do yield limited information about causality, they do provide us with very precise indexes of the strength of the relationship, and oftentimes we can use them in natural settings, and they tend to have fewer ethical concerns, you're not manipulating any aspect of the situation. And you're certainly not withholding information from people, usually in a correlational study. And so they have fewer ethical concerns. Uh, let me stop here now. We do have one final topic to discuss, which is uh, theoretical approaches to the study of groups. But in order to keep this presentation relatively brief, I'll stop now. Thank you, as always, for joining me.